to discussing the global burden of diabetes mellitus and reviewing um, the physiology of glucose homeostasis, we now proceed to understand what diabetes mellitus is all about by looking at the pathophysiology and later on learning about its management based on the pathophysiology. So we proceed with the second part of today's um, clip class. Again, this is Dr. Anna Angelica Makalalad Hoswe. Um, our, we'll first discuss type 1 diabetes mellitus. So type 1 DM is um, the physiology will be very different from your type 2 DM. Your type 1 DM is a disorder resulting from a chronic autoimmune destruction of the insulin-producing pancreatic beta cells. So basically, it's your own body killing its own beta cells. So as you can see, this slide shows the presence of insulitis in a patient with early onset type 1 DM. As you can see, it's being invaded by your CD3 positive cells um, uh, slowly killing your beta cells that will eventually lead to your insulin deficiency and you will have diminished number of beta cells throughout the years. Okay. So in patients with type 1 DM, they have observed that there's a decreased overall weight of your pancreas, there's atrophy of the dorsal region, there's also exocrine atrophy and lobular loss of beta cells. So the natural history of type 1 diabetes is shown in this graph. Before, I used to think that there was an acute autoimmune event that would trigger the DM and it would present with PKA. But later on, I learned that it's actually a, a progression from a pre-disease state, meaning there's just genetic predisposition, so this could even start as early as when the patient is still in utero. And then there's a genetic predisposition probably from uh, family history. And then there's a precipitating event. Then the precipitating event will now result in the um, gradual loss of your uh, beta cell mass. And when there's a gradual loss of your beta cell, there will now be a fluctuating levels of your insulin disease. Although the pattern, the overall pattern is still towards uh, overall decrease in your insulin release. So at the beginning, you will have um, a decrease in your beta cell, but this time, the glucose levels will still be normal. But later on, as the cells get more depleted, it now enters your phase where it could be symptomatic okay and when the beta cells are depleted by about um, 80 percent so there are only 20 percent remaining then the patient will now present with over diabetes okay and at this time it's important to note that you can still have some form of c peptide so, so in the philippines sometimes you use c peptide to diagnose type 1 dm but it's actually not a very good indicator, especially if the patient is still in this part of the natural history of type 1 DM. And then later, and when you lose all your beta cells, you will have no C peptide detected anymore. Um, and you will have um, overt insulin deficiency. And sometimes it's only discovered when you, let's say, screen for DM for like young patients or if the patient develops PKA, okay? Or because type 1 DM patients are very prone to ketoacidosis because they're insulin deficient. So in type 2 DM, it's a different scenario. So the three cardinal abnormalities in type 2 DM is first, a resistance in the action of insulin or insulin resistance. By your, on your peripheral tissues, you have insulin but it cannot work on your peripheral tissues such as your muscle fat and also your liver aside from that there's also defective insulin secretion particularly in response to a glucose stimulus so if you have a non-dm patient versus a dm patient the response to glucose stimulus will be different and then eventually there's in, there's also an increased glucose production by the liver and this is also brought about by the insulin resistance remember your insulin 
um, facilitates glycogenesis or the storage of liver in you add uh, the storage of glucose to glycogen in your liver and at the same time it suppresses uh, gluconeogenesis but when there's no where there's resistance of action of insulin then you will have more gluconeogenesis more glycogenolysis and then therefore you will have increased production of glucose by your liver or increase glucose, hepatic glucose output. So, as I mentioned, no? so your beta cell damage will be the final common denominator resulting in your hyperglycemia. But there will be other factors contributing to this. So, at first, you'll have insulin resistance, so therefore you will have increased glucose production in the liver. If you have increased insulin resistance in the muscle, you will have decreased uptake of glucose in your peripheral muscles there will be an increase in lipolysis therefore if there's an increase in lipolysis there will be more gluconeogenic precursors available for um, glucose production therefore contributing to your hyperglycemia so if you have a defective pancreatic beta cell you would have a decrease in insulin and um there can also have alpha cell defect that can be from increased glucagon and there could also be a decrease in incretin effect if there's an increase in a decrease in incretin effect therefore you will have less insulin being released for the pancreatic beta cell and um, there will be no inhibition of your glucagon secretion from your beta cell and both will have an um, end result of hyperglycemia when you have hyperglycemia, there's upregulation of your SGLT2 transporters in the kidney, and your SGLT2 transporters in the kidney will facilitate increased glucose absorption in the kidney. And there, if there's increased glucose reabsorption, then that will again contribute to your hyperglycemia. And there are other factors such as your brain. In DM, you have increased appetite, decreased morning dopamine surge, increased sympathetic tone, and they're all contribute eventually to hyperglycemia there are other defects this is just i think this is just 11 this is the egregious 11 now it's unlocking 13 or they've added some more um defects that they've discovered to be contributory to the um, type 2 diabetes mellitus so this graph shows the natural history of type 2 dm so it's very different from your type 1 it's different but it's similar so at the beginning, okay, you have normal glucose levels. Let's, so this part of the graph shows your glucose level and this part of the graph shows your beta cell function. So this is the level of your insulin secretion and this is the level of your insulin resistance. So at the beginning, no, you will have normal glucose levels, but your insulin you already have increasing insulin resistance because of increasing insulin resistance your pancreas compensates by increasing more production of your insulin to overcome the insulin resistance therefore you will have a compensatory hyperinsulinemia and then later on your your pancreatic beta cells are unable to cope with that increase in insulin resistance that they start to have defective insulin secretion some of the beta cells um, start to die because they're so tired from producing insulin so they start to uh, they start to produce less less insulin secretion and when you decrease insulin secretion your postprandial blood glucose will start to rise the food that you the glucose that you absorb after eating will not be absorbed. Therefore, it will present as postprandial hyperglycemia. And this will be picked up by your 75 grams OGTP and you will be you will have impaired glucose tolerance. So as the insulin drops further, insulin secretion drops further, your fasting blood glucose will start to rise. And once it reaches the threshold of FBS 126, then you diagnose the patient as um diabetic so the insulin resistance is just there but 
as the years go by the with the presence of the toxic hyperglycemia and further um, load into your beta cell your beta cells will start to fail some of them will die and about 30 years from the diagnosis of DM then you will have very very little um, um, beta cell function therefore if you don't intervene your glucose will fasting glucose will continue to rise so this is the natural history this is what happens if you don't intervene. So what are the metabolic abnormalities? You have abnormal muscle and fat metabolism because of the insulin resistance. Because of the insulin resistance, it cannot work on your target tissues such as your muscle, liver, and fat. So your muscle cannot take up the glucose and your liver cannot take up the glucose as well as your fat. So they remain as in the blood. So presenting with hyperglycemia. Okay? So, the insulin resistance in the liver will also result in increased hepatic glucose output. And your increased hepatic glucose output will be reflected as an elevated fasting plasma glucose. Okay? So, now you understand what is the physiology behind postprandial hyperglycemia. There's impaired glucose utilization. You have glucose, but it's not entering the cells. The increase in fasting blood sugar is because of increase. The, the insulin is not working on your liver, but therefore your liver is producing a lot of glucose. In con they both contribute to hyperglycemia. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the initial reaction of your pancreas to insulin resistance to in is to increase its own insulin secretion to maintain normal glucose tolerance. But at the diagnosis of BM, as much as 50% of beta cell function is already lost, okay? And this is um, the, the, one of the things that contribute to this is glucose toxicity. The elevated blood sugar is toxic to the beta cell and therefore impairs its um, islet cell function and therefore contributes to the defective or decrease in insulin secretion and um, increase in glucagon secretion. And this leads to worsening of hyperglycemia. So it's like a chronic cycle. So in the liver, the insulin resistance will suppress gluconeogenesis. Uh, there's failure to suppress gluconeogenesis and there's decreased glycogen storage, both leading to increased glucose hepatic output. In the, in the adipose tissue, there's increased breakdown of fat or lipolysis and therefore there's increase in free fatty acid flux from the adipocytes and they all um, contribute to the dyslipidemia in diabetes mellitus and a lot of patients with DM also have Nafodi or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And so if you help address your DM, you can actually help the histology of your fatty liver disease as well as improve your lipid profile. So how to prevent type 2 diabetes mellitus? So there's a one big study that compared lifestyle changes and metformin in preventing type 2 DM among patients with prediabetes or, I, or impaired glucose tolerance. And they found that lifestyle was actually uh, prevented um, the development of type 2 DM by about 58% versus just 31% in the metformin group. So it's still lifestyle that is the best way to prevent type 2 DM, especially in patients with pre-diabetes. But in patients with who are high risk for progression to DM, you can actually, you are warranted to give metformin, of course, on top of lifestyle changes. So it's not just metformin that you give the patient that you prescribe, you also advise the patient diet, exercise, etc. Okay, so these are the patients that you should consider giving metformin to. So patients um, who are elderly already, more than 60 years old, just IFG and IGT, you don't need to treat with metformin because the chances of them developing diabetes mellitus will be lower or even the development of complications probably because they'll die before the complications 
start to kick in. Okay, so you just leave them be, let them enjoy life. Okay, so if you have patients who are obese with a family history or with a history of GBM, then you're warranted to give metformin to prevent them from progressing to over type 2 BM. So this are a ta this is a table showing the characteristic comparison of type 1 versus type 2 diabetes. So if you, you just read through this, so sometimes it's hard to, to, to differentiate nowadays because a lot of type 2 DM patients present earlier before type 1 DM patients. You should be um, a disease of the young, but now um, a lot of young patients are already diagnosed as type 2. And also type 1 diabetes can also occur in the adult year. So age is not uh, a, 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 a discrete um, criteria to differentiate the two. It will just give you a clue. Okay, so how to treat? So you usually think of diabetes mellitus in three tiers, okay? So it's not just you just give drugs, that's it. So you have to think of three major things. So one is individualizing glycemic control, not just by medication, but also by lifestyle and exercise, because especially exercise, because exercise has been proven to decrease insulin resistance and therefore improve your glycemic um, control. So next, you treat your associated comorbid conditions, especially your lipids, hypertension, obesity, and of course your heart disease. And lastly, it's very important for you to screen for and manage the complications of diabetes. So you can divide the complications of your diabetes into your microvascular complications such as your retinopathy, neuropathy, and nephropathy versus your macrovascular complications such as your cardiovascular disease, peripheral arterial disease, your stroke, etc. etc. Okay, so these are the three essential elements in the comprehensive care of type 2 DM. So you have your glycemic control by diet, lifestyle, by lifestyle through diet and exercise as well as drugs. Second is treat comorbid conditions. Third is screen for DM complications. So the overall goals on why we treat patients with DM is first we want to improve their quality of life by eliminating symptoms related to hyperglycemia and reducing or eliminating or delaying the long-term microvascular and macrovascular complications of DM and allowing the patient to achieve as normal a lifestyle as possible. So this third goal in DM management is over, often overlooked by physicians. <coughs> Sorry for that. So, <coughs> some patients will have, some doctors will be very glucose centric, so they want a perfect blood sugar, tight control, um, HbA1c within target, but the patient is miserable. He, the patient has hypoglycemia symptoms all the time, unhappy with the insulin injection, unhappy with the side effects of the medication. So that's also very important to consider, not just the, the numbers, but also the quality of life of the patient. Okay, so how do we evaluate a patient presenting to us with type 1 DM? So at the first visit, of course, you have to confirm and classify the diagnosis. You screen or detect complication at the time of diagnosis and potential comorbid conditions. Review prior treatment and risk factor control, such as your obesity, even your smoking, alcohol intake, um, presence of polycystic ovarian syndrome, presence of acanthosis nigricans or physical examination. Okay, also ask for other endocrinopathies. And then, if you have all this information, you can begin formulating a care of plan 
and develop a continuing care plan. So this is the overall outline. So when you are presented with a, uh, a new patient or especially newly diagnosed patient, you have to go through all of this. So sometimes me in the clinic, it would take me minimum 30 minutes, sometimes one hour just going through all of this, especially if the patient is very elderly, you have to explain um, slowly and in more detail. So it will take some time. So it's a very important for you to spend time with the patient, give them a chance to ask for questions. Because sometimes if they don't understand the disease, they think that, you know, after taking the drugs for three months, they go home, complete the three months, they're cured. They don't, they think they're cured, they don't need to follow up. You have to explain how DM works so that they know that this is a chronic disease that they have to follow up and take the medications religiously and follow your advice. So, these are the things that you ask for in the medical history. Okay? So, important to ask for presence of comorbid condition like hypertension, uh, use of steroids, um, endocrinopathy, thyroid disease, heart disease, okay? Because you have to co-manage that with the DM because they commonly coexist with one another. Okay? Very important to screen for psychosocial problems, barriers to self-management. Patients with type 1 DM, Sometimes, uh, when they're young, they're very, what we call, pasaway. You know, they, they, they don't follow because they sometimes undergo a rebellious stage. So, um, that's also a barrier to self-management. So, I think one of the very, very important things you really have to consider is you educate the patient. Because if you educate your patient, they'll be able to help manage themselves as well. So, you don't have to... Um, to do all of the managing, okay? So, here are the other things. If it's type 1, you ask them, oh, even if type 2, you ask them if they've had history of DKA, okay, previous treatment regimens, what have worked in the past, what have not worked in the past, were they previously on insulin, did it work, etc. And very important, this one, don't forget, Episodes of hypoglycemia because this is very, very, very crucial. If the patient is very prone to hypoglycemia, then you avoid drugs that cause them to, that has side effect of hypoglycemia. Or you have to choose, let's say, insulins that are less prone to hypoglycemia because you want to eliminate hypoglycemia before addressing the hyperglycemia. Okay? So here are the, the other things. So you ask for symptoms of microvascular complications, especially your sexual dysfunctions. It's very easy to pick up. Presence of macrovascular complications. And for women with childbearing capacity, you have to ask about contraception because if they get pregnant when their blood sugar is uncontrolled, it's uh, very difficult to treat. Sometimes patient, the baby will have complications. You have to prime them that most likely they will be on insulin therapy if they get pregnant. So here are the things that you look for in the physical examination. Take note, you have to do a fundoscopic examination. If not, you can actually, uh, if you don't have the equipment, you can request for a fundus photo or refer to your friendly um, ophthalmologist. Okay, and a comprehensive foot examination because they're very prone to peripheral neuropathy, peripheral arterial disease, can lead to foot ulceration, eventually to foot amputation. If you are unable to pick up these uh, <clears throat> complications, so remember your BMI, you check this, okay, and be able to classify your patient, and then you check for waist circumference. And then you request for labs. So A1C, if results are not available within the past three months, so your A1C will give you a gauge on how well controlled your your um, the patient's glucose is. 
And your A1C will also be one of the things that you will target when you start uh, managing the patient. So if not performed or available within the past year, you do all this test. So the fasting lipid profile, remember, check for comorbids, liver function test. So when you want to screen for DM nephropathy or diabetic kidney disease, this is the tests that you do, your spot urine albumin to creatinine ratio and your serum creatinine and then you compute your estimated GFR based on your creatinine and you also test for TSH in patients with DIPON DM because they frequently coexist with your autoimmune thyroid disease especially your Graves disease okay so here are their glycemic targets for non-pregnant adults with diabetes so this one again you have to memorize this so your in most patients with DM, the A1C target is le less than 7, but this, not, this one is not written on stone. You actually have to adjust this based on the patient's profile, which I will show you on the next slide. So for preprandial capillary plasma glucose, the target is 70 to 130. So when you prick the patient, ask the patient to monitor at home, this is these are his targets. So if it's postprandial or two hours after a meal, the target is less than 180. If the patient is very young, very motivated, um, you can actually target a lower HbA1c less than 6.5 to decrease. The, the further decrease the risk of developing complications later in life. But make sure that you are able to achieve this without significant hypoglycemia and other adverse effects such as weight gain no okay so you can consider less stringent goals for patients with severe hypoglycemia because we don't want hypoglycemia hypoglycemia is associated with an increased risk of death so this is how you adjust glycemic target so for example, the patient is high risk for hypoglycemia, um, then you make it more less stringent. Okay, If low risk for hypoglycemia, you can go the more stringent path. So if the patient is has a short life expectancy, for example, the patient is already 70 or 80 years old, you don't target an A1C of 7. Your target may be less than 7.5 or even 8. Patients with cancer don't need to be strict about the A1C anymore. Okay? So and so forth and so and so forth. So if there are patients with coronary artery disease, you have to balance this from hypoglycemia because hypoglycemia can push your patients to uh, let's say another MI. So again, hypoglycemia, you characterize it into three glucose alert value usually these patients are asymptomatic usually the level is less than 70 so what we do we adjust the um, the meds okay and you ask the patient to eat fast acting carbohydrates such as juice your milk or candy not coke please not coke clinically significant hypoglycemia less than 54 usually these patients would have some form of um, symptoms usually they would complain of cold clammy skin very hungry um, sometimes they would um, complain of dizziness okay severe hypoglycemia would be any hypoglycemia associated with severe cognitive impairment requiring external assistance for recovery so the key words here is requiring external assistance for recovery. So if the patient lost consciousness because of the severe hypogly, um, that's considered um, severe already. Okay. So the preferred treatment is glucose for the conscious individual. Just ask the patient to drink. If the patient is unconscious, then you can give um, IV glucose or your D5050. In the States, they have glucagon injections. So you can give um, glucagon um, parenterally. I think, I'm not sure if it's IM or sub-Q, but you can inject them because if they're unconscious, they can, you can ask them to drink, okay? So you should also look for hypoglycemia unawareness. Hypoglycemia unawareness are episodes of severe hypoglycemia 
where the, the patient doesn't sense the impending hypoglycemia. So that should trigger treatment re-evaluation. Okay? These are the patients who just suddenly lost conscious. They don't know that, they're already, they're, that their blood sugar is already dropping. Okay? So that's your hypoglycemia and awareness. So how do we <clears throat> treat by lifestyle? So the first line, of course, is um, diet and exercise. So you teach the patient how to manage themselves by educating them and supporting them. Okay? You give them the control over their own um, diabetes, okay? So, you started a diagnosis and you continue it every time you see the patient for follow-up checkup, okay? So, diabetes self-management education and support should be patient-centered, respectful, and responsive. So, when you go into the clinics, make sure you're, you don't use um, punitive language or language that serves to degrade or why. What did you, 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 you refrain from telling the patient, oh, what did you eat? Why are your blood sugars like this? Why are you not following my instructions? So don't, don't use that language because it's very discouraging for the patient and you might lose your patients along the way. So four critical points for the delivery of um, diabetes education. Again, a diagnosis annually. And when there's new complicating factors that arise that influence self-management and when transitions in care occur. So for example, they're pediatric, type 1, they go into adulthood, then you should um, educate the patient. Or for example, um, transferring of service from primary care to endocrinologist. When you proceed to when you think the patient needs insulin therapy, so there's a transition from oral to insulin, then you educate the patient again. Uh, what are the goals of nutrition therapy? You have to promote and support healthful eating patterns, emphasizing a variety of nutrients, dense food, in appropriate portion size. So my patients, usually I don't really um, ask them to avoid a lot of foods. I just tell them it's portion control. Very few things that I tell them to avoid completely so so that it's important for them not to feel too deprived okay so you they should be encouraged to achieve and maintain body weight goals attain individualized glycemic blood pressure and lipid goals and prevent complications of diabetes okay so make sure you take into consideration personal and cultural preference I'm sure in India you have a lot of vegans so you have to respect that also or people or uh, Muslims will um, go into Ramadan and you have to respect that also you can't tell them all oh, you can't fast because you're diabetic no you can you can actually adjust the the treatment regimen based on their um, cultural religious preferences okay so make sure you maintain the pleasure of eating by providing non-judgmental messages about food choices okay so physical activity most adults please remember this 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous activity over at least three days per week Okay, so usually I ad advise the patients to exercise at least 30 minutes, 5 days a week. Okay, if the patient is obese, you want them to lose weight, you advise them to do it 250 minutes per week. So roughly about an hour a day. Sometimes I ask them to break it down, especially if they're re really busy, break it down into 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the afternoon. So you, you try to be flexible with with the lifestyle of the patient um, and you you there's no strict um, um, choice of exercise it's not always jogging it's usually the the choice is whatever the patient enjoys so that they will be able to sustain that physical activity so you ask them um, what do you like what do you like any sports do you, or do you like swimming do you like tennis do you enjoy basketball or do you enjoy jogging biking so you ask them what they want and that's what you encourage them to do okay sometimes people so busy you can encourage them to just do like 10,000 steps a day by making cutting down the use of their elevator 
cutting down the use of motorcycles or in the Philippines, we ask them to limit the use of tricycles. So to encourage them to walk. Uh, if you walk for one hour, you can actually achieve 10,000 steps and that will help you burn about 400 to 500 calories per day. So you have to decrease the amount of time spent in daily sedentary behavior and you have to interrupt sitting every 30 minutes for blood glucose benefits. And they've shown in studies that, that um, allegedly that um, inter um, preventing prolonged sitting can actually reduce mortality patients. Okay? So other recommendations, very important to encourage smoking cessation, immunization. These are the things you recommend to your patients. Pneumococcal vaccination at the age of any age if the patient is diabetic, has diabetes and then you have another injection at the age of 65 years old. And of course, yearly influenza vaccinations. And of course, don't forget the psychosocial care. Okay, if the patient is really very depressed, undergoing a lot of diabetes distress, you can actually refer to a psychiatrist to help them cope. Some psychiatrists, they give medications to help the patient cope with the disease. Okay, because they're very prone to um, depression, anxiety disorders resulting from the demands of their diabetes. How about pharmacologic therapy? Okay, so for type 1, it's really insulin. No? In patients who exhibit some form of insulin resistance, like obese type 1 patients, you can actually consider giving metformin on top of type, on, of, on top of insulin. Of course, you cannot shift totally to metformin. Okay, and then you can consider educating individuals. Um, carbohydrate counting. Carbohydrate counting is you match the amount of carbohydrates in the food with their um, insulin dose. So these are very advanced um, education that you have to really spend time on the patient, especially long-term type 1 DM patients. Okay. So most individuals with type 1 DM use insulin analogs, but the reality in clinical practice is since this patient need insulin for a long, long time, usually um, the more in expensive insulin analogs are difficult to sustain so we usually have to stick with human insulin so most patients my, most of my patients with type 1 who i see in the charity clinics will be on human it's better to have human insulin regularly than use insulin analogs occasionally because these patients cannot be off insulin for a long time because they will you will push the patient to diabetic ketoacidosis. How about for type 2? There are lots, lots of medication. But metformin, of course, is the first line of therapy if not contraindicated. If it's tolerated, it is the preferred initial pharmacologic agent for type 2 DM. Very effective and very cheap as well. Okay? So sometimes if they, the patients have are on long-term metformin therapy, uh, they can develop vitamin B12 deficiency. So in the U in West in the Western world, we they actually measure the levels of vitamin B. But in our country, um, if the patient has anemia, looks megaloblastic, we just give vitamin B, or we just give vitamin B. Okay, we don't test anymore because the test is very expensive. So you can consider insulin therapy with or without. Um, oral um, anti-diabetic medications if the patient has very, very elevated blood glucose levels with an A1C of more than 10. Although this is not a hard and fast rule. Sometimes, um, triple oral therapy can be comparable to insulin therapy in this subset of patient, very high blood glucose levels, very high A1C levels, but only a select um, patient's especially if the patient is very, very apprehensive to start injectable therapy. You can actually try triple oral therapy. And some studies have proven that they could be, um, they could have similar efficacy. So again, 
I cannot overemphasize patient-centered approach to guide choice of pharmacologic agents. So these drugs, the newer drugs, they're very effective. They have a lot of benefit, additional cardiac renal benefits, but they could be very expensive. So you have to talk with the patient. So if the patient cannot afford, then you can do you can you can still give your sulfonylureas. It will achieve the same um, glycemic benefit, although there's a risk of hypoglycemia and um, there's the lack of renal cardiac benefits, but at least the patient can take something as opposed to giving the best medicine, although the patient cannot afford it. So it's really a conversation between you and your patient, okay? So if you have a patient with DM newly diagnosed, you start first with metformin. If the patient, the A1C is um, greater than 9, you can consider dual therapy. So you can start with metformin plus any other um, oral antidiabetic drug. And then you can... If it's more than 10, you can consider injectable therapy in the form of insulin or your triple oral therapy. So here is the algorithm. So this is actually an old algorithm. There's a new algorithm in the 2019 ADA guidelines where they, they separated those with cardiovascular risk, the renal um, impairment, because um, your SGLT2 inhibitors and your GLP-1 inhibitors have been proven to decrease cardiovascular um, events um, compared to your other oral anti-DBT drugs, such as your SUs, your, your bioglitazone, and even your insulin. Okay. So in insulin therapy, um, the progressive nature of type 2 DM should be regularly and objectively explained to type 2 DM patients. So it doesn't mean that the patient will be transitioning to insulin therapy that they have failed. So you have to emphasize this to the patient that it is not because they failed with managing their diabetes but or their diabetes has worsened but it's just the natural progression of the disease that their beta cells will eventually die and they will require insulin okay so avoid using insulin as a threat describing it as a failure or punishment so some pa i usually give my patients a self titration algorithm so that they can manage their insulin doses on their own and some patients on long-term insulin therapy are actually very adept with adjusting their own insulin regimen. So usually we start with the basal insulin and then later on we add either a GLP-1 receptor agonist such as your liragrotide or we add a prandial insulin to cover for the meals. Okay? So it's very important that when you consider pharmacologic therapy, you address um, two or more of the defects in your beta cell in order to improve your hyperglycemia. So, how about since page, I, we mentioned before that the second, the second um, essential element of diabetes mellitus is the management of comorbid condition. So, heart disease and diabetes go hand in hand. So, there's a two to three times increased risk for heart disease among patients with diabetes. About thirty percent of coronary stents were placed among patients with diabetes in 2011 and patients with diabetes have about 280,000 heart attacks per day and patients with diabetes have two to four times higher risk of death for diabetes and 60% chance of dying from diabetes. So, so you don't just focus on the glucose, you focus on the whole patient including the heart. Okay, so how do we treat? For hypertension, the blood pressure target is 140 over 90. So usually the agents of the BP medications of choice would be your ACE inhibitors and your ARB. Second line would be your TZ, Isaid like diuretic, and your calcium channel blocker such as your amlodipine. So um, some patients would require multiple drug therapy. So you just don't monitor the blood sugar, you monitor the blood pressure as well. Okay. For lipids, of course, you have intensified lipid therapy and optimized glycemic control. Some patients, when you treat the diabetes, the triglyceride levels go down with it, okay? And then the low HDL, 
you have to target um, patients with HDL less than 40 and less than 50 for women to increase their HDL levels above these levels. Okay, For patients with fasting triglycerides more than 500, then since the patient is at increased risk for developing pancreatitis, then you're warranted to give treatment for um, triglycerides such as your phenofibrate. So this is a common mistake among general practitioners when they see an elevated triglyceride level. Sometimes it's just 200, 250. They treat again. They treat right away with phenofibrate, and phenofibrate is very expensive. Sometimes it's about 40 pesos per tablet. When in fact, when you ask them to go on a low carbohydrate diet, treat their diabetes, their triglyceride levels will go down on its own without having to treat with another expensive drug. But if it's more than 500, then you're warranted to treat because of the risk of pancreatitis. So how do we treat patients with dyslipidemia? So we differentiate the patient um, between age less than 40, age more than 40, and with or without um, CVD risk. So if the patient is less than 40 years old, no risk for no no um, risk for cardiovascular disease, so you don't need to treat. But if less than 40 with ASCVD, you treat with um, high intensity statin, okay? Target less than 70. If patient is more than 40 years old, no CVD risk, you are warranted to give um, moderate intensity statins regardless of lipid levels. But if the patient is more than 40 with ASCVD, then you're warranted to give high-intensity statin regardless of lipid levels. But the target would be at least less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. So the lipid levels is not the only consideration, but the CVD risk and the age of the patient. So here are your high-intensity statin and your low-moderate-intensity statin. So... Remember, age more than 40 with CVD risk, high-intensity statin. More than 40 years old, no CVD risk. Less than 40 years old with CVD risk, moderate intensity. Ah, sorry, less than 40 years old with um, ASCVD, high-intensity. More than 40 years old, no ASCVD, moderate intensity statin. Okay, I will pass this in the exam. Okay, when you write your prescription for your DM, it has to be partnered with a statin most of the time. So don't forget that, okay? So I will ask this in the exam. So how about if your patient gets hospitalized? So if your patient gets hospitalized, what do we do? We have, we have to perform an A1C. So the A1C would give you a gauge on how controlled the blood sugar is before getting admitted. If not performed in the prior three months, most patients would be would be have to be shifted to insulin therapy if the patient exhibits persistent hyperglycemia. If there's no persistent hyperglycemia, you can actually maintain them on their previous oral anti-diabetic drugs such as your metformin. So the target glucose will be different when your patient is admitted versus in the outpatient um, setting. So if the patient is in the inpatient setting, the target is 140 to 180, especially for critically ill patients because we want to um, avoid hypoglycemia also. So you can use basal insulin, okay? And the sole use of insulin sliding scale, very, very notorious among residents, is strongly discouraged. So you can do a sliding scale, let's say, in the first 24 hours, but then after the first 24 hours, you really have to decide whether you're going to proceed if the, with a basal insulin or around the clock insulin therapy. But you cannot maintain the patient on a sliding scale, okay? So there should be a plan for preventing and treating hypoglycemia. If you write your orders for insulin, you have to partner it with an order for a D5050 if the patient develops hypoglycemia or the blood sugar is less than, let's say, 70 or 80. 
Okay? It should be documented and it should trigger you to reevaluate your insulin or your um, diabetes um, treatment regimen. Okay? So last, the last essential element for your diabetes mellitus is the management, screening and management of your complications, which are your microvascular and macrovascular complications. And for this, I no longer have any more energy, so I will ask you to read the standards of medical care in diabetes, the abridged version. So, okay, we'll give you a copy. I'll email to your liaison officer. Okay, then you can look up in the internet the pocket cards with key figures and even a free webcast if you're interested to um, to learn more about this. Okay, so these are my references. And um, these are your reading assignments. So thank you and have a good day.